great to great to be with you guys, and uh, just hope to hope to get to know y'all over the next over the next few hours and over the weekend. Um, this morning, as we kind of dive into a few different topics, um, what what I would like is I would like for this not to be a uh, one-way street of information passing where I sit up here and talk for the next three hours and you guys all just after about 30 minutes not off. But hopefully hopefully we have some interaction among our tables. Hopefully we can have some interaction back and forth. Um, so if I if I ask any questions, you know, just go ahead and go ahead and respond. Um, even if you even if you're not sure if it's a rhetorical question or not, just go ahead and respond to it. That'll be fine. Um, and uh, but we're gonna we're gonna kick this off. Let's let's uh, let's open up with a word of prayer as we as we begin. Um, Father, God, we're thankful for what you are doing among the peoples of the world. Uh, God, how uh, Father, you are you are sending your church, God, to reach those who are without hope and do not have, God, anyone yes. that is sharing the good news of Jesus with them. Father, we just um, we thank you for, for the way that you're doing that. You're using your church in that process. And Lord, this morning, God, as we, we look at your word some, as we, God, think on how, God, we can, um, we can best go about trying to reach people for Christ. And uh, Father, to see churches planted, Lord, we just pray that you would, um, God, you would work in our midst uh, this morning, God, that we'd have good conversation, good dialogue, and Lord, that, um, God, your name might be glorified and people might hear uh, as a result. And we just pray and ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, a lot of what you see, what you'll see up here on the screen today, a lot of that will also be in front of you. Um, because I realized today that we're going to cover a lot of information. We're going to cover a lot of different topics. And um, I do not expect you to remember absolutely everything that I've said this morning. Although we will give a test at the end. Um, Dal, Dal has uh, been faithful to work up that test. Um, so it's... Uh, True, false, and um, short, short answer responses. I think is what. You know what we said? Oh yeah, personal interview. Personal, personal interview. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I, I think this is important as we get as we get going. What is um, what is missions? Okay, this is a term that we hear all the time, especially if we're uh, if we're if we're in Southern Baptist churches that are giving to giving to Lottie Moon. And um, I'm noticing a lot of Southern Baptist churches are doing something, and um, they're, they're calling it missions. Uh, but, but, but we're hearing this phrase a lot. What, what, what do you guys, what, what, when I say missions, what do you guys think? Anybody? Well, the word mission is defined by an important act carried out. Okay. An important act carried out. Specifically in the context of when we say, uh, when we use this towards Christian missions, what, what do we mean? What is our, what is our purpose? What, what is this act that we're doing? Sharing the gospel. Sharing the gospel with people, okay? Um, so this is, all, this is all part, these are part of missions and the missionary task. So let's, let's take a look this morning. Um, at God's word in um, in the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew twenty eight. This is uh, a famous passage here, but Matthew twenty eight. as he's uh, leaving and he's gathered he's gathered his disciples near 
And he tells them what? He says, uh, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the ends of the or to the end of the age. Okay? So Jesus gives a clear command to do what? To go and make disciples of, uh, of all of the nations. All of the nations. Uh, that word nations there uh, does, not necess- does not mean, in, in the original language, does not mean uh, geopolitical entities. So it doesn't mean the United States, it doesn't mean Mexico, uh, Guatemala, China. Uh, the word there is... is more closely related to <coughs> ethnic groups, people that share a common culture, a common identity, a common language. And so uh, Jesus is saying, go to all of these groups and make disciples among them. Okay? So th- this, is, um, this is targeted. This is, this is intentional. Uh, this isn't... Um, some have, some have made the mistake of trying to say as you go. Yes, maybe as you go. But also, there is an intentionality by which we go to make disciples of the, the, word, that, the word that we use in, in, in mission terminology in our world is we use the word people group. Um, so the group that you guys are working with in Tehalapa, uh, this is a Zapotec people group uh, in Tehalapa and... Um, this is, this is a group that needs the gospel. They have a common identity. They have a common culture and language. Um, and their culture and identity is different from a lot of other different ones that are in the state of Oaxaca. And so you guys are intentionally going for a, for a purpose. Now, when... Um, after, after Jesus had left and the day of Pentecost had come, um, something astounding happened. So Peter goes out and as well as all of the other disciples who had just received the Holy Spirit, and they go out and they begin to do what? What are they, what are they doing that day? What are, they, what are they proclaiming that day? The gospel. They're proclaiming the gospel in their language. In the language of the people. Now this was a supernatural act of God. Uh, you, God gave his church the ability to speak in different tongues at the time, different languages. And so they're sharing the gospel to them. And then Peter stands up and he kind of gives this big summary of, hey, listen, these guys aren't drunk. Uh, no, they're, they're, they're telling you an important message. And... Um, and in that day, we see that, what, 3,000 people believed, and they were baptized. And then this is what happened in verse 42 of chapter Acts chapter 2. It says this, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, uh, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles, now all the believers were together and they held all things in common. And they sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had a need. And every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and they broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And every day the Lord added to their number of those who were being saved. Okay, so we see that we see this where evangelism takes place, but the work does not stop at evangelism. The work moves to church planting. The work moves to churches being formed. All right, the people were meeting together daily. The, the, the people were devoting themselves um, to hearing from God's word that was being spoken, that was being taught through the apostles. 
Uh, they were in fellowship together. They were in prayer together. Uh, they were carrying out what we would call the uh, today the ordinances. You see this breaking of bread. They were they were they were they form a church. And uh, tomorrow you just have to come back tomorrow. But tomorrow we're gonna, I'm going to share a little bit about what ends up happening to this church that started here in Jerusalem um, after they were scattered. And so, but we see this path. We see though. The New Testament pattern is, is that it, it, it's not just evangelism, but we see evangelism and discipleship that lead to what, what is the result that we're after? What, what's that result? What do we see here in this passage? What do we want to see evangelism and discipleship lead to? A growing of the church. We want to see a church. We want to see churches. Because the means by which God is going to uh, make himself known among the nations is going to be through the church. And he's going to use not just the church, big picture, but he's going to use the local church to make that happen even globally. And so when we look at the missionary, when we look at missions and the missionary task, um, this, is, this is what we're talking about. Um, and so part of that from the scripture you see we, we, we have to there's, a, there's an aspect of going um, Dal was telling me a little bit about your community here um, that a lot of people move in and uh, really don't like to be bothered <laughs> but they've come down here to retire they, they've had people bother them their entire life and they want to retire here they don't want to have anybody mess with them. Um, so we can have a tendency to do the same thing where we just sort of form our own little bubble and uh, we, can, we can sit there nice and easy. But there's an aspect of the missionary task, there's an aspect of missions that is going, that is entering into places. And so we, we see this up top, uh, entering. So part of the mission, first part of the missionary task is entry. Um, then we move to evangelism, discipleship, forming of a healthy church, developing leaders, and then exiting from that place. Um, and so we'll, we'll, kind of, we'll kind of break these down individually. Um, but you, you, have the sheet in, you have the sheet in front of you, and it comes with a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of different scriptures on there. But let's, let's look at this first one. Entry. Um, can somebody, somebody read this out? Somebody read this out loud. In order to carry out the missionary task, we must have access to people who need to hear the gospel. This part of the task includes four elements. Research, presence, identity, and communication. Okay. Um, so how you enter into a place is going to affect the rest of the missionary task either positively or negatively so if we miss this early phase of entry we can, we can almost kill I can, I've seen works killed from the beginning um, because a lot of people went in with one idea on this is how we need to enter this place without learning anything about the people that they're trying to reach. And, um, and so missing this early phase for the work um, can, can really kill that work. So understanding your people, the culture, uh, to help gain access and trust to your people. So... Um, so as we go in, we want, we, want to, we want to learn about the people that we're trying to reach. Okay, so, so let's, just, let's just put it this way. If, um, if, if you guys are trying to reach people that have moved down from, I'll just say Vermont, okay? Somebody from Vermont? Yeah. I just saw that. Little, 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 I, I literally just threw out, I, I, I promise, I just threw out a... Uh, We've been trying, trying to get away. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Well, today's the day. Today's the day. Today's the day of salvation. All right. Oh, um, if you guys are going to reach people from Vermont, um, good luck. What, but, but let me tell you something. And this is perfect because now I can ask questions. <laughs> Do you like people showing up on your doorstep and knocking on your door? No. No, you don't like that. Now, if you don't like that, is that going to be the best approach to getting a message to someone that doesn't want doesn't want you to be there in the first place? No. You you've got to figure out what is going to be the best way to encounter people from Vermont. Okay? And so if, if knocking on their door is, is not is showing up at their house and knocking on their door when they had no idea that you were coming is not the best way to reach people from Vermont, then even your good intentions are, are, are going to cause you trouble in trying to plant a church among the people of Vermont. Okay, And so in the same way, as you're working, as you guys are working in Mexico, this is, this is what you want to be thinking about too. Who are we trying to reach? Because we have to understand that the people that we're trying to reach, they're not like you. Okay? And a lot of times we tend to assume, um, we tend to assume that everyone is like us. Now, I, I, am from, I am from the South, and I just say, God bless some of us from the South. Um, because we tend to assume that everyone thinks and acts and does everything just like, just like us. Well, Southern culture, that's just, man, that's just the way. Is there another way? You know? And, and people, and, and, but seriously, though, and we then project that a lot of times as we try and evangelize to people. And people are not necessarily always, I don't believe, they're always as turned off by the message of Christ as they are to us. And we see Paul, he kind of took on this attitude to, the, I'm going to become all things to all people so that I might win some. And, and that's the same attitude missions that we want to take. Um, we want to enter well. We want to learn about them before, um, before we just start acting. And so uh, the other thing we want to know is we want to know, their, we want to know the language that they speak. Um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pick on you guys now. I can't talk to you. Um, but, but I've noticed that there's a difference in the language between the panhandle of Florida. I don't know. Have you noticed there's a difference in the language between Texas and Vermont? Mm -hmm. okay. We've got some different language, okay? And um, we, want, we, we need to understand the, the language that we're speaking. And so as you guys are going to work in Mexico, you, I don't know if y'all realize this, but they don't speak English. Um <laughs> Uh, you guys are going to primarily be able to work in Spanish, which is which is a great which is which is great. Uh, you don't have to go through three different languages, but um, even being going between two gets really tricky. And the other thing is, one one of the things that I've noticed is that words sometimes um, have have different have different meanings to them. The same word can have two different meanings to two different people. So if, if we were to say, um, if I were to say spirituality in a church culture in the South, what do we think about? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. <laughs> anybody, anybody else? What are we primarily going to think about? Christian fellowship. Okay. Yeah, we're going to think about we're going to think about Christianity. Okay, we're going to th that's what we're going to think about. We're going to think about Lifeway, you know, all those all those good things. Um, if I were to say spirituality in the Northeast, 
What does that mean? You could be talking about Wiccans. Okay. So, when you ask someone, tell me about your spiritual life, you better be prepared <laughs> that the answer is going to be different. And you want to make sure that as you communicate, you also <laughs> communicate different. You communicate a difference. But if you don't understand the way people think and the what words mean to them, you can really make some big you can make some big mistakes in this area. So we want to learn what language do they speak, and then not only what language, but how do they speak it? What are you know what is that? So some other things that we want to think about is is the format of the gospel. Um, does how, how does the gospel need to be presented in this context? Um, some of you guys that have come down and worked with us uh, in, in Mexico, we've, we've been talking, talking through this process of what we call uh, storying. Um, and, and, and essentially what storying is, is it's for a culture that we say is an oral culture. And what we mean by that is information is not passed through reading materials. Now, what we are doing today, this is for a literate culture. Bullet points, give me my details, let me, let me just shoot down the list and let me know them. That does not work in oral cultures. In oral culture, we, we, we transmit information through the use of story. And so in the places where you're working, that's what you're, you're, you're doing. You're communicating the gospel through the stories of God's word that communicate who he is and what he has done. And so we want to know, how do we need to present the gospel in this context? Um, we, we want to answer some questions. We're going to look at this word later, um, but uh, the word syncretism, all right? And this is when, if, if we're not sure about the culture, we, we contribute to what we call syncretism. And syncretism is just a combining of two beliefs to form something completely different. And um, I, I could go through a lot of SBC churches right now, and I could show you syncretism, where we've combined uh, Southern culture <laughs> with Christianity, and it has formed something completely different. Um, so we, we want to think about those things. Uh, we also want to think in our entry, as we're looking and understanding this people, what is church going to look like here? Is it going to look like this? Or not? Does it need to look like this or not? And so um, here, it may need to look like this. Uh, this is what people are used to accustomed are, are used to seeing church as as okay. Where we meet in this type of building, and so people are used to that here. Um, that's fine. So we want to look at those types of things. Uh, the next thing we move to in this <clears throat> is well is evangelism. So we've understood, we're, we're, we understand our people, we understand the people we're trying to reach, and what we're trying to say is we don't understand them perfectly, okay? Um, we've been living in Mexico now for, for four years, and uh, we've, I've worked in Latin America for over six years, and I, I don't, like, I don't understand the people we're working with completely. I understand some, I understand some cultural things that are very, very important, and I understand um, some language things that are very important, but I'm always a learner. So as, as we're going through this process, we understand that we are, we are constantly in a phase of learning. So it's not like, we, oh, we have to understand all these people completely before we can share the gospel with them. But we do want to understand something about them. And so... Um, Evangelism. So evangelism is what? Somebody read this for us. Evangelism is the proclamation of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit with the aim of persuading people to repent and believe in Christ. Okay. I want to I wanna make a point here. Proclamation. Okay. Um, entering into a place, learning about the people establishing ourselves among them. Um, so, so for example, uh, you guys have chosen to, to work with the community uh, in a way to help, to help their entire community, okay? Uh, by meeting some basic needs, 
and things like that inside of, inside of their community. Uh, that's a way of entry. That's an entry point for you to get into the village and, and, and to be there in Mexico. But just because we go in and do good things, that does not mean that the gospel is being proclaimed. And it does not equal Christian missions, and it certainly doesn't equal evangelism. And, and the, reason, the reason I say this is um, there, there are a lot of great organizations out there that are doing some fantastic work, and they're not believers, followers of Jesus. And so just because they're doing good work does not point to people that don't know Jesus. It doesn't point them to Jesus. Does that make sense? They, they, they can be a help in that process, but it's only a help in that process if, if, if we're actually proclaiming a message to go along with it. And so, um, so we want to be communicating the good news, and we want to be communicating it in a way that people can understand it. Okay? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick on Dal now. Um, but Dow, Dow's working, Dow's working on his PhD. He's going to be Dr. Dow before long, I'm sure. But see, here's the thing. Dr. Dow, y'all like that? That sounds good. Here's the thing, though. Uh, if, if Dow started using all of his big uh, seminary language that he's garnered over, over time, most of the people in your church are going to look and go, Huh? <laughs> what are you talking about, Dal? Um, I'm telling you, we learn some of those useless stuff in seminary, but no, it's not useless. It's just it, 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 we, it's it's like it's like when you go to see the doctor, and that doctor, good doctors, not only know how to treat your illnesses, but they know how to explain your illnesses to you. Does that make sense? Doctors that you want to go back and see. They know how to explain your illnesses to you. And so in, in the same way, we're trying to use a terminology that's coming from the scriptures that can be very hard to understand for outsiders to this. And we want to communicate it in a way that people can understand. And so, um, so evangelism, we, we, we have to be proclaiming the gospel. And as people come to faith, um, we want to be making disciples. So part, part of evangelism is making disciples, but we want to not just share the gospel with them, great, they've come to faith, um, but we want to disciple them. And so, so, Can I ask a question before yes, you please. get into the discipleship part? Um, between entry and evangelism, how long does the whole entry process typically take? I know each case can be different, um, but... Like you were saying, you can't just knock on somebody's door and say, hey, you need Jesus. Come to Jesus now. They're not going to accept that role. So once we've established um, our research and we've done our presence and we understand their identity and we can communicate well, then the proclamation comes in. I know you look for opportunities to proclaim throughout those spots, but... How long does that process usually take? It, um, it really just depends. Here's one of the things where you guys are a little bit ahead of the game. Um, one, we give you guys some training before you enter in. So we, we've done some of the work of research and entry for you. Um, because there, there's a steep learning curve. And so we want, to, we want to get those things out of the way. So we've eliminated some of that process for you in that. The other side of that is um, <clears throat> we don't send you out there by yourself. Um, so you guys have primarily been working with Betty as an interpreter. Betty's been working in the village there for um, almost two years now. And so we, we're, we're also sending you with a cultural guide. Does that make does that make sense? Um, it's just the learning curve in these places when you don't speak the language is so high that if we don't send you with someone, you 
it's not that you want to, but you can really make some you can really make some uh, big big challenges for yourself going forward. Uh, I can tell you of churches that have, I can tell you churches that have done that for themselves, and, and it took a long time to pull themselves out of it. Um, but just simple things. I mean, just cultural things like food, um, greetings, uh, simple things like that make make a big big difference. So we've kind of eliminated some of that learning curve for you guys, um, so that so that hopefully after a few tr a couple trips, two or three trips, you can really begin to start communicating with people and sharing the gospel with them. Um, so. There's not necessarily a, 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 a timeline, and there's a lot of different there's a lot of different thoughts on this. Well, it'd be better that they hear the gospel, than not hear the gospel, and so there, there's there's just there's just some wisdom issues. There's just some wisdom issues in as, as we're looking at sharing with people and evangelizing them. But I, as far as a specific timeline, it just depends on the information that you have going in. Um, if you have little to no information about this place, I would I would suggest just being cautious and sharing more through times of asking questions about their beliefs and who they are, rather than going in with an intention of we're going to go door to door and share share with hundred people today. Does that does that make sense? So at, in the context of we're out and we're, we're, we're invited into someone's home. And uh, they, they, they're going to serve us up some fresh tortillas today and they've got some beans cooking. and So we sit down and eat and, you know, we're asking questions about them. We're asking questions about their family, uh, what they do for a living. Um, <clears throat> you know, then we, we look over and we notice they've got... They've got this altar set up inside of their house, and man, it's a lot. You know, I, I, I don't know. Where I grew up, we didn't, we didn't have that. You know, what, you know, tell me about that. And they, they begin to tell you a little bit about their beliefs and their faith. And, and, and through that, we can begin to communicate with them um, the gospel. And, and, and or, or as we're in conversation, you know, one of the things that we do a lot here is, or that our family does, is we'll be talking with somebody and, They'll be sharing something about their family or a struggle or a challenge they're facing. And we'll say, oh, you know, that reminds me of a story from God's Word. You know, could I, could I share that story or something? And we begin to communicate the gospel to them that way. But, like I said, we, we've kind of taken away that learning curve. Um, but even if y'all were going to go to plant a church 20 miles north of here, I would say you need to learn, you need to learn a pretty good amount about that community before you just decide to bust in there and, and uh, break the doors down with evangelism. That's just that's just my thought. That's just my thoughts on it. Um, I'm not going to quote that as scripture, but does that? I don't know if that answers. Well, I would say no matter what, research is the real big key. I mean, research is, is the key. It, it really <coughs> is, and, and and I think there I, there is some there is some biblical precedent for this. Um, when you when you look at Paul, and Paul goes to Athens, and uh, he he's there and he's seeing all of the people worshiping all of these gods. What what Paul is doing though is Paul has spent some time listening before he starts speaking. He doesn't just break in there and disrupt the whole place and start speaking. No, he waits until the right time. And after he's learned a little bit more about their faith, he says, you know what? I've observed that you've got this thing to an unknown God. Now, there's another example, though, when Paul is in, 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 um, in Lystra, Lystra, when he goes and um, him, Paul and Barnabas are there. And they start sharing in Greek. And what happens? Do y'all remember what happens? Paul heals Paul heals a guy. And then um, they start sharing about it in Greek. Do y'all remember what happens? Yeah, they think they're gods. They think they're gods. 
They said that, though, in the Lyconian language. And Paul and them were sharing in what language? Greek. And so somewhere along the way, there was a misunderstanding. And Paul and them, it took everything they could to try and convince them that they were not gods. Now, I, I don't know, but maybe, maybe had they had been speaking in Lyconian, they could have explained that a little bit better. I, I don't know. I, I'm just... There are some ideas here in the book of Acts where, you know, maybe some of these heroes, they were trying to figure it out just like we were, you know, and uh, with the Holy Spirit, they were trying to figure some of this stuff out and, and what it looked like. Uh, we're just pulling this based off tons of missions history. This is, this is 2,000 years of missions history, and what we've seen has created challenges in areas, and what we've seen is not. Um, so... Um, the central, but the central command of the Great Commission is to do what? Is to make disciples. A disciple is more than a person who has mastered a set of information or practices a set of spiritual disciplines and shares the gospel. Discipleship involves the intentional transformation of the heart, the mind, the affections, the will, relationships, and purpose. Um, and so some of the things that we want to look at inside of the cultures that we're looking into is what does transformation look like in this context? And so let me, let me just present an idea to you. Uh, my my sister-in-law, um, she grew up in a Mormon church. Uh, she was very, you know, very, very moral person. Um, did, did all the right things, very many of the things that we say that we as Christians should do. She, you know, she was, she was by all accounts, a good person. It would probably have been considered a good Christian had no one have known about her beliefs. Um, later she came, she came to faith, and, um, and so now, anyway, she, she married my brother after that, but what is transformation going to look like for her? Mm. Now, transformation for her, a lot of it looks like the fact that she was willing to sit down and tell her parents, who were leaders inside the Mormon church, that um, I'm no longer following this, and this is not the one, this is not the one true way. And but what is transformation going to look like in the context that you're working in? What is it going to look like for people from Vermont? What is it going to look like for people from Tehillapam? And, and understanding what that's, thinking through what that's going to look like. Um, because we don't want to just create a bunch of people who have the right answers. But we want to see people that are transformed by the gospel of Jesus. And it shapes who they are completely. I was reading this morning in my quiet time about uh, the rich man who came to Jesus and he said, uh, Master, what does it take to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you need to obey all the commandments. He said, well, I've kept all these since I was a boy. He, by all accounts, he was a good guy. By all accounts, he was a good guy. Jesus said, go and sell everything you have. And follow me. And he went away. And so, like, the evidence of a transformed life in him, or as we saw in Zacchaeus, was what? Giving it away. It was going to be giving it away. And, and, I, and I would ask that question, I would ask that question for the American church as well. Are we not very similar to the rich young ruler? I will follow you to an extent. I will do all these right moral things. But, don't ask me about my money, pastor. <laughs> um, so what is transformation going to look like in an American context? What is it going to look like in a Mexican context, and I can tell you what it's going to look like in Tehillapa. One, it's going to mean people are willing to be baptized. Uh, we typically do not count numbers of people coming to faith until they have been baptized. Because it is the key, it is the determining factor. 
Um, because it is a clear picture to their community. I am leaving behind the traditions of my family and of my ancestors and of my community. And there's typically um, problems that go along with that. Um, one of the key things that you're going to look at, too, is uh, issues, uh, issues of alcohol. Um, you know, I, I don't know what your church's stance on all of this is. I, I've never read anything where I think it's a sin. But inside of these communities, though, um, alcohol is not consuming a glass of wine before dinner. Alcohol in these communities is for one purpose. Wasted. Drunken. That, and, and the problems that it leads to of domestic violence, um, extramarital affairs, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Um, inside of these communities, it's going to look it's going to look radical for people if they have transformed lives in these communities. Um, relationships, uh, what, are, what are their relationships going to look like? Um, their attitudes. So thinking through some key issues to address, and then also as we're discipling people, the point of making a disciple, what, what's the point? Hey, do we have any teachers in here? I know we've got a teacher or something. We've got a couple of teachers. Like, like in the church oh. teaching or teaching school teacher? School teaching. Oh. Okay, school teaching. Okay, in church teaching too. That's fine. Um, you count, Jared. What is the goal? Yeah, you can't. You count. No, never mind. You count. <laughs> um, it's fine. It's fine. I don't want to make everybody feel welcome. The point, though, of teaching is what? To equip them to be independent. Yes! The point of teaching your children is to make them adults. Go away! <laughs> <laughs> Support <laughs> yourself! <laughs> Kick that out and come back to me and we'll share together what the Lord has blessed us both with. Um, okay? And so, that's the key in discipleship. We want... We don't want people that just have a bunch of information. We want people that know what to do with the information. And ultimately, if we're, especially with raising kids, uh, we want to raise kids that can one day do what? For themselves. And bring us grandbabies. <laughs> Grandchildren. Let me tell you what. And, and our grandchildren, just the crowd... On, 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 a, on, on a parent's head, you know? And so, I, I, I say all that to say, like, obviously we've reproduced something in our children that they are capable of making sure that your grandchildren don't die. So, um, <laughs> so here's, I, my parents, I've often wondered, you know, I've often wondered, are they worried about that? And I think sometimes they are. Why don't you take my grandchildren to Mexico? But um, we want to reproduce, and that's the same thing in discipleship. Um, we don't, we don't want to teach something that someone else can't go and teach tomorrow. We don't want to teach something that someone can't go and teach tomorrow. So um, this is a key in discipleship. Um, as we form, as we disciple people, as people are baptized, a church is a group of baptized believers in Jesus Christ who are committed to each other, to the body of Christ, to one another, who meet together regularly and carry out the functions of a biblical church. Okay, so as we do this, we're going to we're going to form churches. We're going to bring these believers together um, because they will be for one another. They will be the family that, um, that they will have. Most, a lot of times in our context here, uh, when, we, when we come to faith, you know, it, it, it's not as much a leaving of our family. But in a lot of contexts around the world, they are going to lose all family. They're going to lose all friends. It is no wonder why the early church met together daily. They didn't have anybody 
we've got co-workers, we've got family, we've got friends, we've got all these people, and you know, we, we live in a society that is relatively tolerant. So it, it's probably going to look different in this context. Um, you know, so some things to think about as you begin to work on planning churches is, are, are we going to have a, is, is there going to be a building? Is that, is that going to be a necessary step or not? Um, if we do, what does that need to look like? We're going to address some of these issues later. Um, what's the music going to sound like? I don't know if y'all have listened. Y'all ever been to a Mexican restaurant? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, everybody's been to a Mexican restaurant. It's the best food on the planet, right? Amen. Um, <laughs> but it, it's not Mexican food, but it's good. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> but but at, at, these, at, at the restaurant they play this music in there and it sure does sound different than the stuff we listen to on the radio here okay music is going to sound different guys okay we don't, we don't have to translate the Baptist hymnal for them and uh, we don't have to reproduce organs you know bring organs in and, and uh, you know we, we, just, we just need to figure out what's the best way for them to worship the Lord in song and, and, and allow them to part in that. Uh, what's church service going to look like? You know, I don't know. I grew up in, grew up in the South. It was supposed to end at 12 mm -hmm. so that we could be the Pentecostals to the restaurant. Mm -hmm. Or the Methodists. But, or the Methodists, yeah, either one. Um, you, you can always be the Pentecostals. They, they go until about 2. That's right. um, so <laughs> you just got to, you're on a tight line to get the, the Methodists to the restaurant, you know. So, but... Here, I don't know, they may, they may, you know, we, we, we used to do this thing, it was like potluck Sunday, you know, and we did it like twice a year or something like that, and, you know, or at homecoming, and, and those are the, like the only times that we ever ate together as a church family. Now, we also had 500 people in our church, and it's really noisy, so it's not really eating well together like that, but... You know, I don't know, here in Mexico, they may, they may eat together every single Sunday. And their church service may not start until 4 p.m. in the afternoon, and it may last till 8. I don't know. I don't know. That's okay. We just got to be okay with that. What is church going to look like in this context? And let's, let's see it form. Um, and then after this, biblical leadership is essential to the well-being of every local church. And God calls different people to lead in different ways. Um, the New Testament specifically identifies two offices of church leadership. Um, I know you see like four terms up there. These are the words that we see in the scripture. Pastors or elders or overseers um, and deacons. So... Um, we want to also train and develop out of these group of disciples uh, people who have been called by the Lord to take on uh, these tasks and lead. And, and typically what we, um, what we would like to see is we would like to see leaders develop from there. Um, so don't worry, I, I don't plan on y'all ever needing to send Dal down there to be the pastor of the church in Mexico, okay? Mm -hmm. that, that's never going to be our goal. Um, but Dal may play a huge part in helping to train a pastor. Yeah. Okay. And that, that's what we would love to see. Yeah. Um, but and some things that we have to remember in this leadership development process is that uh, some of it is going to be messy, okay? Um, when you are discipling people that have come out of a very, very, what we would consider immoral culture, um, you're going to have some situations. Um, and you're going to have some situations where you've got people who are coming out of alcoholism. You're going to have situations where a man was previously married to another woman, but the woman he's with now is not his wife. Um, but he hadn't seen his wife in 10 years. He didn't even know where she's at. Um, you're going to have, I'm just telling you, it's going to be, <laughs> I, we see it all the time. It's going to be a mess. And it's going to make you want to pull your hair out um, because there's not going to be a lot of clear-cut answers. 
but but just working through that mess and allowing the Lord to uh, find those find those. And, and the, the, the other thing I want to make a note of as you think about this for Mexico is, is that leaders are not necessarily defined as the best readers in your group. One of the things that churches typically do um, is they find the guy who's the sharpest guy in the entire group because he can read and he's had education and he's done this or that or this or that. And we go, hmm, this guy right here, he's it. Yeah, but he's also arrogant. And no one else likes him. He may not be the best guy to fill that role. Maybe it's not the best reader. Maybe it's... So there are just challenges that you have to think through as you think through leaders and developing them. And then finally, what, what we do in this process is we move out of um, uh, we move out, or our goal is to complete the missionary task in each people group or place, and then to exit uh, with the new churches from the place of people as our partners in the ongoing task of global evangelism. So when we say exit, it, it, it's kind of like when your kids leave your house, you know, and, and they're they're. Not when they go to college, but when they're real adults. Okay? Kids, sorry, when y'all go to college, you're still kids. Um, when you go to, when you, when you have, when, you, when you're supporting yourself, that's when you're an adult. Okay? Um, that, that's what we believe. But, so, our goal is to be, see self supporting churches that we can now partner with. So it's not like we exit, hey man, I'm, we were glad to be with you guys for the last 10 years. It was wonderful. But no, these are people that we love dearly. And, and we see that over and over through Paul's letters. And so that partner relationship continues. Um, but they can sustain themselves without our presence there. And so this is kind of kind of where we, where we go in this spectrum. So um, <clears throat> entering... Evangelism, discipleship, healthy church formation, leadership development, and exit. Um, <clears throat> we're going to move into a, a kind of a different topic or expound a little bit on one of the topics that we've talked about already. But before we do that, let us let's take a break. <clears throat>